Does your starter cable look like this? Let's face it, 7.3 diesel engines need all the help they can get to start, especially in the cold, and corroded old starter cables and beat up terminals don't help. When I bought my 7.3 van, the main positive terminal was falling apart. It was held tight with a screw into the battery post. Not ideal. Sometimes when I turned the key, nothing would happen. I hadn't learned about the 7.3 no start flow chart yet, and when mine wouldn't start, it wouldn't even crank. So I started throwing parts at it. Turns out it was the transmission range sensor, but before I figured that out, the van got a sweet starting system upgrade. In this video, I'm going to show you how I upgraded the starter cables and the length and the sizes of the materials you'll need to do yours. So first, let's take a look at what the original starter cable wiring looks like. I'm going to keep this pretty simple and focus on the starter cables. There's obviously a ton more wiring to a 7.3, but we'll save that for another video. The 7.3 Power Stroke is a big diesel engine and it needs a lot of energy to start, especially when it's cold, at least 1500 cold cranking amps worth of batteries. The starter itself draws about 170 amps with no load and between 230 and 630 amps under load according to the bench tests. That's a huge amount of current. To supply that kind of juice, the vans have two starting batteries. One is located under the hood, but because of the severely limited space there, the other is located on the passenger side frame rail outside of the van. These two batteries are in parallel, which means that they're treated effectively as one 12 volt battery bank. If you replace one of them, you're supposed to replace both at the same time for maximum longevity. So how are these batteries wired into the van? Let's look at the positive wiring first. The underhood battery has three positive wires coming off the terminal. There's a one out wire that goes to a starting relay mounted on the inside of the passenger side fender. There's a long one out wire that goes to the frame mount battery and there's a 2 watt wire that goes to the starter. There's also a skinny little wire that runs from the relay to the starter, and that's how the ignition switch ties in and energizes the starter. On the negative side, both batteries have a one watt cable that grounds to the engine block with 10 gauge chassis grounds that come off of the ends of that. So that system's not bad, but it's not the best. I got into an online debate a while back with an internet expert who was trying to tell me that the Ford OEM solution was perfectly engineered. I'll concede that the Ford solution has worked well for over two decades on a ton of vehicles. But the truth is, it's a compromise between cost and function. Basically, it's the cheapest way to get enough power for the starter to fire the engine. Problems are, though, that the frame mount battery is pretty remote. It's subject to a lot of corrosion from dirt, salt, and moisture. And energy from that battery has to travel all the way to the underhood battery and then to the starter and it's subject to a lot of voltage drop. It's also receiving less power from the alternator when it's charging due to voltage drop as well. Long term, that's not good for longevity. If you're replacing your starter cables, chances are you're also at this point running a few aftermarket accessories, speakers, LED light bars, winches. So it makes sense to me to upgrade the entire system, do what you can to reduce resistance, and minimize voltage drop. So what do I mean by voltage drop? This is a 12 volt DC system, that's direct current. I like DC electrical systems because they're easy to understand and relatively safe to work with, but they suffer from serious voltage drop because of the resistance in the battery cables. What that means is that the voltage at the battery will be higher than what reaches the starter because of that resistance. The good news is that there are two easy ways to reduce voltage drop shorten the cables or use bigger cables. Now we don't really have the option to shorten our cable runs without moving the location of the frame mount battery, but we can definitely make them bigger. There are charts that dictate what size wires to use for a given amperage and distance, but if you look at this chart, you'll see that when we get to 200 amps or more, two watt wire is a minimum regardless of distance. Now remember, the frame rail battery is connected with one watt wire from the factory and the whole battery bank connects to the starter with two watt wire. The wire run distance from the frame rail battery to the starter is pretty long as well. It's over 15 feet total. So to me, two watt wire is the absolute bare minimum 
for the kind of amperage that we could see when the starter's trying to fire up a cold 7.3, and it's probably undersized. So on my van, I did a couple of things to reduce resistance and increase the ampacity of the starter cables. First, I upsized all the wiring, and I used high quality tinned marine copper cable. This is the most corrosion resistant option and way better quality than any welding cable or the cheaper options that you'll find. The drawback is that it's more expensive and a little stiff to work with. So I ran 2 watt wire from the underhood battery to the starting relay, as well as to the frame mount battery. And I used 3 watt wire from the underhood battery to the starter. I upsized the starter relay wire to 10 gauge. And most importantly, I added another 2 watt cable from the frame mount battery to the starter. So in total, these upgrades more than double the amount of copper conductor that runs between the batteries and to the starter, and that means more voltage reaching the starter. Also, the batteries will be working more evenly and they should last longer. Now let's talk about connections. You can buy a cheap hammer crimper online for less than 20 bucks, or you can buy a Chinese hydraulic crimper for not much more, and thin lugs are like a buck or two a piece. Now, I've used a bunch of crimp tools over the years, hammer crimps, lever action, hydraulic, and I've compared the crimp quality that I got out of all of them. The reality is you get what you pay for in a crimp tool. These crimps matter. They're the connection between all that expensive wire and your batteries in the starter. So don't cheap out on them. Poor quality crimps cause the conductor inside the crimp to break, which leads to poor connection quality, and that creates resistance. Resistance causes heat. At worst, when we're talking about bigger DC systems that power inverters, for example, that resistance can cause enough heat to melt terminals and even start a fire. The hammer crimps, their quality varies wildly and I've never seen one that I've been happy with. The hydraulic crimpers are all over the place as well. The dies are often just randomly sized and you're left guessing which is the proper size for a given lug. And they seem to either under crimp or dramatically over crimp, which leaves ears on either side of the crimp. The last straw for me with the hydraulic crimpers was having one spring a leak and fail on literally the first crimp I tried to use it for. So now I use the FTZ Correct crimp and FTZ Power Lugs for all my cable crimps. This lever tool creates beautiful airtight cold welded double crimps that will never fail. They're highly consistent and resistant to corrosion and vibration. I also coat the ends of the wire lightly with dielectric grease before crimping and cover the whole joint with adhesive line heat shrink after crimping. Is this overkill? Maybe, but coming from the marine world, I know how quickly corrosion can destroy a connection. And the last thing that I want is to be on a big winter road trip in Alaska and have a no start condition because of a corroded ground wire. As an aside, I'm not sponsored and I have no incentive to recommend these particular products aside from having tried a bunch of things over the years and found what I think works best. All right, let's talk about solder. I see folks recommending that you solder your connections on social media all the time. So a well done soldered connection is probably better than one of those cheap hammer crimp jobs, but in general, solder connections are more susceptible to failure over time due to corrosion and vibration than good crimps. So the bottom line is, if you need reliability in harsh conditions, stick to high quality crimps. If you want to learn more about this, I show more details in my video on installing a house battery. Aside from battery cables, there are some other things to consider as well. I upgraded the starter on my van to a Denso style gear reduction starter, which spins faster with less current draw. It should help the engine fire up a little bit faster. I'll share the details of the starter upgrade in another video. I also replaced a starting solenoid that's on the inside of the passenger side fender. This is an easy bolt up replacement once you have the batteries out. It's also good to note that this is where the alternator charging ties into the system. As for batteries, I'm still running the basic auto parts store flooded lead acid batteries from the previous owner. But when they eventually fail, I will upgrade to the Odyssey PC1750T absorbed glass matte batteries. To compare these, the basic $200 parts store battery weighs 45 pounds, has 750 cold cranking amps, and a two-year limited warranty. The OEM Motorcraft batteries for the 7.3 weigh 46 pounds and have 850 cold cranking amps. These Monster AGMs weigh 58 pounds, have 950 cold cranking amps each, and a four-year limited warranty. AGM batteries handle deep discharge much better than flooded lead acid, 
and they hold up way better in harsh, high vibration environments, which is common with our 7.3s. At nearly 400 bucks a piece, they're not cheap though, so hit the subscribe button and consider using the affiliate links in the description below if you want to buy anything that I've shown in this video. It won't change your pricing at all, and I'll earn a small commission, maybe enough to buy a power lug for my next project. I've also included in the description the details for all the cable links that I used. Something I've learned working on my 2002 van, as well as tearing apart a 1998 E350 for parts, is that the vans can vary a whole bunch, so I would recommend pulling your cables and measuring them before you cut your new wire, and leave a good bit of surplus on the new cables for service loops, also to accommodate bending that heavier, stiffer wire into place. So materials cost for my project was just over 300 bucks, including wire, lugs, heat shrink, protective loom, and heat shielding wrap. There's at least one website offering custom battery replacement cables for the 7.3 van, and their cost is about 350 with shipping. But that quote is for 2 aught all around, and I used 3 aught for the underhood battery to the starter, and they don't include that extra frame battery to starter cable. So I saved a few bucks doing this myself, not counting my time, but most importantly, I know the quality of the materials and the construction. I see questions about this on social media all the time, so I hope this video answers some questions and helps you better understand the starter cables on your 7.3. If you found this video helpful, please support this channel by hitting the like button and subscribing, and let me know in the comments below if you have any other questions or if there's another topic you'd like to see more on. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time.